The only way to really analyze the economy is to look out your window. Don't tune into the financial stations. That's propaganda. That's that's BS. That's the vestige of hope to keep you in the market so that uh, the insiders can start selling, which is another reason I think that 2024 this year and the next year we don't have much longer to go. As you see what the actual pros are doing, especially large uh, concerns, you know, like a J. <clears throat> Jamie Dimon. Hello and welcome back to Sora Financially. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the FJR Mining Guy on Twitter and the CEO of the Sora Financial Group. Thank you so much for joining us here in Vancouver in our studio. And uh, we got a fantastic discussion lined up with the David Morgan of the Morgan Report. Somebody we haven't had on the channel for a while, and I don't know why we haven't had him on, but it's time to catch up with him and see what, what is happening in the world. We're gonna put the macro in context with the micro, and for us, the micro is the precious metals, the mining stocks as well. How are they behaving right now? How is the current environment affecting uh, our sectors that we are, of course, very heavily focused on? And to do that, we're gonna discuss the macro and then, of course, come down to the micro. Before I switch over to my guests, just a quick reminder, hit that subscribe button. It helps us tremendously, bringing guests like David on the program and of course uh, hit that like button as well because it tells us that you like the content and the questions asked of course as well so thanks so much for that and uh, now let me introduce my guest on the screen david thank you so much for joining us again it's good to see you okay thanks for inviting me absolutely yeah no it's it's been too long uh, that we've chatted david um that's why like i think we need to start at, at zero almost again because we need to discuss the state of the economy like uh based on your opinion how, how are we doing right now how is the economy how are the financial markets doing I'll give you my opinion, but <clears throat> I love to be, you know, fact based. And the facts are that the global economy is contracting. <clears throat> Yet you see, you know, all new all times high in the major indices in the United States. So there's, as I've said for several years now, three years or more, that there's a huge disconnect between the summation of moving indexes like the DJI or the S&P 500 and the actual physical economy. They really don't reflect each other. Unfortunately, a lot of people really don't understand that. They see that their portfolio is doing well, the Dow's making a new high, S&P's making a new high, and they believe that that means a strong economy, the growth factor is still in place, and all this basic propaganda. So the overall economy has been contracting, and that portends for slowing things down and uh, a loss of a standard of living. In other words, everyone's standard of living decreases, not increases. So that's where the economy's at. You can look at, you know, several examples quickly, just on a more or less U.S. concentric basis. You look at all the corporate restaurants, some that have closed permanently and others that uh, are closing shop of many that are in areas that are not making a profit. And that's across the board. I mean, Applebee's, a lot of the, even McDonald's. I mean, and I think the fast food industry is on uh, a, <clears throat> a collision course for more and more closures. I mean, uh, it's just the costs are so high and the minimum wages are so high that the profit margins are so low that uh, go out of business and can't make a profit. So it's not only in the food industry, it's, you know, Bed Bath & Beyond. It's a lot of retailers, of course, with the illness in March 20. When it you know officially started, a lot of shops got closed because of the shutdowns, and they're never coming back. And then, of course, you look at the labor force. Say, well, David, you're wrong. I read the labor statistics every time they come out, and you don't know what you're talking about. Look at all the growth in the labor market. Well, yes and no. I mean, the old adage that figures lie and liars figure holds some weight because, as a quick example. Some guy making 100000 a year in IT is laid off. So now he's working two or three jobs, and his combined total for three jobs is 70000 not 100000 He's working many more hours. And yet in the labor force statistics, it looks like there's been a gain of two jobs. But really, it's the same person working three jobs. So is that every case? Is that everything? No. And yet, if you also study it, in the manner I do, which you take a kind of a longer term view and look at the inside numbers, they're always adjusted. They're almost always adjusted down to get this, you know, death birth, death birth index adjustment, seasonality adjustment, and all this 
stuff that's put into these statistics. So overall, contracted economy, slowdown in the economy, labor uncertainty, inflation is not really pulling back as fast as the Fed would like, and the markets are in uncertain territory, but uh, people don't know where to go. And with all the money that's being printed, it funnels into the stock market. Absolutely. Like we're seeing that melt up phase S S and P 5,000. Uh, and as, as we're speaking, we're trading above 5,000 points again as, as well. So ma massive melt up rally. It seems like, do, do you see an end in sight or like how much longer is this going to continue? Like how much longer can we ignore, as you say, facts? Yeah. You know, <laughs> I had a client call me and I'll, I'll say it in public because Although somewhat embarrassing, I'm not the only one and I'm not making excuses. But he said, you know, you've been saying this can't go on much longer. You've been saying it can only go on a couple more years, three at the most. But you've been saying that for six years. <laughs> and he's right. <laughs> and he's right. And I'll admit it. So my answer is I don't know. I think I've always given that truthful an answer. But it seems almost impossible that it could go on much longer. And I say that for a couple of reasons. And that is, you know, as the Fed loves to say, more data. We really haven't gotten to what I consider the acceleration or the exponential phase or the hockey stick, however you want to frame it, uh, until the last few years. <clears throat> Where we've added, what, 40% to the overall money supply in the last few years? That's an exponential curve. Those, <clears throat> and especially being a commodities trader in the past and, you know, I'm a student of the markets my whole life. Whenever you see something go parabolic, you know it will not last much longer. And that doesn't matter if it's soybean oil, silver market, stock market, the money supply. And that's where we're at. So based on that, will I say a couple more years at the most? Sure, I will. Uh, will it be sooner than that? Actually, I do believe so. I think this year will be the, the shift in consciousness for investors worldwide. But things are not coming back to normal. There is a decrease in living standards. And these indexes are just numbers. They don't really portray how well the economy is doing. I think that will be burnt into the consciousness of every man and woman that invests in the markets at any level. Then after that is 2025. That's after a new electorate has taken place, whether it's blue, green, purple, or red. I really don't care. They cannot stop the economic consequences of living this life. So I think in 2025, you'll start to see more unraveling and maybe a push toward the new financial system, whatever that looks like. We have, a, I would say, a vague idea. We have a fairly good idea of what the money powers want, but whether or not they'll be able to implement that or not certainly remains to be determined. And there is some pushback. So we'll see. We got to elaborate on that, Dave. We we have to talk more about that. Like, here, well, what's the end game as well? But before we do that, I may, I'll make note of it that we'll get back to that because I want to like talk a bit more factors that are leading to that uh, change in momentum, change in policy, and then, of course, then monetary changes as well. Um, you mentioned jobs and the labor market. I think government jobs are a big factor there as well. I think the IRS alone hired eighty thousand new employees or so uh, just in recent months. Um, US, U.S. elections is another topic I want to talk about, just based on implications, but also um, the U.S. debt. So, uh, and the debt, debt spiral that we're seeing. It's not a death spiral just yet, but it's a debt spiral. Um, I, th I think the question I'm, I'm going to ask you here is like, what, what's the straw that's going to break the camel's back? Like for some reason on this podcast, we always talk about the straw that breaks the camel's back. Not ever, not everything, not ever about the positive. So I'm curious, David, like based on uh, uh on your opinion there is like what's going to break this the, what's going to break the camel's back here loss of confidence <clears throat> i mean it's a confidence game there's confidence in the u.s dollar being the world's reserve currency but let's analyze that for a moment <clears throat> you know just a few years back if you were going to mitigate the use of the u.s dollar as final settlement in oil you might lose your life you know you look at Gaddafi. Uh, it'll get Saddam Hussein and basically anyone that wanted to extradite themselves from the U.S. dollar as final settlement in oil didn't have a, a long lifespan. Now it's common. Uh, the Russians and the Chinese basically do oil trades in their local currencies. The BRICS do a lot of trade in their local currencies. So the dollars being um, taken away from a lot of these settlement mechanisms and that trend will continue. If you look at what the BRICs hold and you believe that, you know, the he who owns the gold makes the rules, you're 
pretty much mistaken. I know the adage, I know it well, <clears throat> but really energy is what makes the world go round. And if you look at the energy uh, mix, 60% of the world's oil is held by the BRICS countries now. So they hold the lion's share of energy, which really is the most important commodity out there. So I think it's going to be something, and I've used this analogy before, Kai, but it may work again. It's probably not going to be a deliberate thing, although it could. There could be a, you know, a false flag of some type. It could be a cyber attack. It could be a money center bank. It could be banking failures that get out of control or pretended to be out of control. I mean, there's a lot of black swans out there. But I think it could happen instantly, meaning, as I've said in the past, you know, the bond, the head bond trader for the U.S. Treasuries in Japan starts selling more than normal just to get a cash position. And then someone in, uh, you know, Hong Kong picks that up and says, I wonder what they know that I don't know. They're selling, you know, 10% more than they ever have in the past. I think I'm going to increase our selling. So selling pressure builds. And then the Swiss see that both the Japanese and the Hong Kong markets are offing U.S. treasuries, maybe at the 10-year level, maybe at the 30-year level, whatever. And says, you know what? What do these guys know that I don't know? <laughs> and you can see where I keep going with that. Is that hypothetical? Yes. Is it a probability? Perhaps. Is it how big a probability? I don't know. But in a market of total uncertainty where we don't know what the dollar's worth day to day, where we don't know what the next year's output is going to look like as far as uh, foodstuffs and the oil market. I mean, we have a general idea. My point being is that a lot of nation states are becoming uh, resource savvy and they realize it's not a piece of paper that holds value. It's what's really in the ground. Either you have to grow it or mine it. And if you look at it from that perspective, you start to uh, covet what you have on your own landmass. And, you know, for instance, what happened in Mexico here recently with, you know, this open pit mining proposal. So there's a lot of things going on that the general public doesn't see, it doesn't analyze, because the only way to really analyze the economy is to look at your window. Don't tune into the financial stations. That's propaganda. That's, that's BS. That's the vestige of hope to keep you in the market so that... Uh, the insiders could start selling, which is another reason I think that 2024 this year and the next year, we don't have much longer to go. As you see what the actual pros are doing, especially large uh, concerns, you know, like a J <clears throat> Jamie Dimon, I mean, often what, $4 billion in stock? I mean, these are clues. They're pretty obvious if you know where to look that um, this paper paradigm is ending Will it end totally? No, it won't. It'll shift to something new. There'll be a bridge. You know, your stocks aren't going away uh, necessarily. But uh, <laughs> so I'll pause there and give it back to you, Kyle. Yeah. No, it's like lots of good points. And one I note down as well is the U U.S. oil. And uh, I think we need to talk about that a bit more since you're making out uh, energy policy as a, as a vital part of uh, like what part of the collapse, maybe. Um, the petrodollar is what I want to talk about, and how how important is the petrodollar still to the U.S. dollar? Right? Can can the U.S. dollar survive without being part of the petrodollar? Does that make, does that make sense? That question I'm asking. Yeah, no, it seems it's like a good you, you mentioned. Uh, yeah. Well, so it became, the, its importance is diminishing, right? So yeah, sorry absolutely, it is diminishing, and it won't go away, and it won't die, but it's dying, and um, primarily because <clears throat> it's no longer required to settle oil. And oil is the most important commodity, as I said a moment ago. So that means that it's losing status more and more really every day. And the only way to get the suckers to continue to believe in the dollar and hold confidence in it is to give them a reward for holding that old maid. And the way you give them confidence to hold the old maid is you increase the interest rate. So you say, well, I want to be rewarded for taking on this added risk. And the way you do that is you increase the interest rate. However, we're kind of at the limit there. Much more of an increase in interest rates is going to contract the economy even further than it already is, and probably accelerate it. And it will accelerate even without an interest rate change, by the way. I mean, I think, as usual, the Federal Reserve is reactive, not proactive. So they'll start lowering rates when it really won't have any effect. Not that they would if they started tomorrow, in my view. 
but <clears throat> they will mitigate the problem to the best of their ability, which isn't by manipulating interest rates, although that certainly affects the economy, it's rhetoric. It's what they command out of the mouths of these purported experts that don't know what the heck they're doing, but pretend as if they do. And they'll try to calm the markets by saying things are fine, we still have growth, the economy's never been stronger, and all this BS that we hear constantly. So we are in a contraction, it can't stop. The acceleration to the bottom will continue and it will accelerate. And at some point, <clears throat> there will be a moratorium of Bretton Woods II, uh, the meeting of the minds, a uh, major money center bank that comes out with their own token. Who knows? But something will happen. And it's already happening, as you know, Kai, I mean, with this Fed Now program that the Fed implemented, what, in September? I forget when it started. It's not been that long ago. So they're already prepared, and I think there's 92 countries that are looking at their own cryptocurrencies. So they're, they, the money powers, are definitely preparing for a shift into a new system. We'll circle back to that topic, CBDCs in particular, because I know the EU has also put in, uh, what do you call it, a paper to, to sort of uh, install CBDCs starting in 2028 as well. So uh, we'll talk about the new monetary regime here in a second. I just want to talk... One, one last question on oil, real quick. We're not an oil-focused channel, but uh, the U.S. is the largest oil producer in the world um, right now as well. Um, does that change any of the, the positioning, like any of the strategic positions in the world right now? Does the U.S. have maybe even more leverage right now than we, we give credit for? Yeah, that's an excellent question. It does. I mean, all markets move at the margin, and the margin is the U.S. market. The reason that it's the U.S. market is because of fracking. Racket is highly inefficient and it's got a decline curve that's almost unbelievable. I mean, it's like 60% in two years in most wells on aggregate. So we're at the end of the end, meaning that if we lose that ability to continue to have more oil than anyone else because it costs too much, uh, we've drained the fields, uh, whatever, then uh, that will certainly have pretty big effect on the dollar and the oil markets. Having we said that, enough as well. Yes, since we're contracting, the demand for oil isn't what it was. I mean, look at something as simple as how many people are staying at home and working from home instead of going to an office building. Now you've got, what, 40% office space in San Francisco that's up for bid because no one's in there. I mean, that's an extreme, but it gives you the right thinking. So, you know, the oil problem is kind of mitigating itself because of less travel. Um, but that doesn't mean it's going away completely. And anything at the margin that ends uh, will affect it. And it certainly will. I don't think that the US will be the oil leader for much longer. Um, I say that uh, not, not gladly, I'll tell you. But nonetheless, that's what I think will happen. Okay, no, thanks for, thanks for that. Um, Interest rates you mentioned as well. I want to talk about that as well. Uh, based on the data that we're being provided, it seems like there's a higher for longer scenario even possible. Um, even Maybe even uh, the rate hike um, might be in the cards. W what's your stance on the interest rate? Like you sort of hinted at it, but I just want to go a little deeper on that topic. And uh, how do you see it trickling down into the economy? Yeah, I've been a bit of a maverick here, Kai. I mean, when everyone said they couldn't go above, I you know, pick a number three and a half or whatever, I said no. I said, that the interest rates are going well, first i i agreed with my, the consensus very briefly and then i thought it through and i said no and i went on my maverick stance i said no the fed will increase interest rates until something breaks and as far as i'm concerned that happened i mean you had silicon valley bank silvergate and these other banks that failed you've got one failing in new york right now and that's breaking the system you know, at a low level. But those banks weren't, you know, mom and pop banks. Those are pretty significantly sized banks. Plus, all of the, those big three were tied to uh, the crypto world. So I and there's more pressure on uh, inflation. I mean, the Fed wants to control it, thinks perhaps they can control it with interest rates. But nonetheless, it's a psychological phenomenon more than anything else. Yeah, it's a supply chain. It's what costs are for labor. It's a lot of factors. But the thing that's not talked about is the inflation psychology. 
And that's something that I experienced in my old age, you know, being lived on the planet as long as I have. And back in the Nixon administration, the Nixon administration put on wage and price controls at 4% inflation. Think about that. We're above that now. Of course, there's no talk about wage and price controls. The official inflation rate at the end before Volcker stepped in was 13%. But during the Ford administration, after Nixon left office in shame, they came out with something very brilliant. They had these little buttons that said WIN on them, W-I-N. Whip inflation now. Now that shows you the characteristics of the political class versus the basic citizenry of how stupid they really think we are. We think you put on a button that says whip inflation now, you're going to take care of the problem. But we're almost in the same condition now, Kai, where the government says, you know, I command inflation is going to go back down to 2%. All you have to do is watch the data and keep interest rates high until that happens. When the psychology of the person on the street None of them buy stocks. None of them are in the stock market. All they do is they buy gasoline to get to work and they put groceries on the table to feed their kids. And they really don't have much time to get invested. Now, they may have an employee benefit program. They may invest in the stock market indirectly with a you know, benefit program of some type of 401k or something. But most working class in America really don't give a fig about the stock market. All they know is they've got to work for a living and they can hopefully save something. And when they see prices going up and up and up, uh, they listen to what they see and act accordingly, which means they're going to presume inflation is here to stay and maybe going to get worse. And that psychology is hard to break. They don't care what Mr. Powell says on the television set, that inflation has moved from you know 4.2 to 3.8%. We've had a great move down in inflation. All they know is the next time they buy peanut butter, it costs more. <clears throat> yeah, no, it's uh, what's the official number? 3.1%. Yeah. So that's, uh, of course, outlandish here as well. I'm, I'm in Vancouver right now, and food inflation here is just ridiculous up, up here as well. In, in, in particular, food inflation. We don't even need to talk about rent and housing and all of that. So it's uh, insane. Um, uh, U.S. debt, I quickly want to talk about, and then the U.S. elections as well, because I think they're somewhat interconnected, those topics. So I'm curious what your thoughts are. Um, you know, the debt spiraling is uh, the debt is spiraling out of control, and we'll soon have a new president, uh, or maybe the old president. We'll, we'll, we'll find out uh, in November. But uh, uh, how does that fit together? Like, how do you see that developing as well? Not none of the candidates mentioned anything about saving money. <laughs> well, it's historic that the Fed will soften interest rates to make whatever the incumbent is, whatever party's in power remain in power if they say they're apolitical and to some extent they are, but generally speaking, you get a softening during the election year. So will that take place this year or not? I don't know. It remains to be determined. I don't think, again, that whatever they do is really going to have a big effect. I think that um, the political system has been have questioned so much by both sides that I think there's a possibility, not probability, but a possibility that both sides will call foul no matter how the election comes out. I mean, if the left wins, the right will say it wasn't fair, and if the opposite wins, the other side will say it wasn't fair. And really, there's been meddling in elections for a very long time, but it's probably not to the extent that we've seen in most recent times. But regardless, I've always been in the opinion it's a selection, not an election, and that uh, the money powers pretty much control both sides. And even if you don't believe that, you don't have to. If you just look at what the legislative branch does, in other words, what Congress passes at law, it's uh, an agenda that continues regardless. If you read blue, green, or purple, it doesn't matter. The agenda continues. So if you're a realist and you look at objective fact, you realize that we're being run by the corporations, not by any political class. But yet we have this entertainment going on where people will stand up and yell and filibuster and make a lot of announcements and run TV ads and all this distraction to prove just how important your vote is. Uh, it's always an interesting season, especially when you get the because uh, in the US you can do it. You can have competing ads. It's like you can have you can actually have your competitor. Uh, like Coca-Cola versus Pepsi is a good example. You can you can have uh, what do you have that like competition the clashes. 
you can actually talk bad about your competitor in, in ads in the US. You can't do that in, in Europe. So it's always interesting and fun to watch those uh, political campaign ads, but also just TV ads in general, I think. It makes, it makes for good entertainment, as you say. Um, David, we need to talk about how the current Fed environment and the Fed funds rate environment affects the precious metals as well. One question that follows uh, that, that line of thinking also is like, how geopolitical is the gold price right now? Because uh, when we heard that uh, the Fed and, uh, or sorry, last week, we've seen um, the inflation rate come down or come out as well. So it was like, oh, we might stay at a higher Fed, uh, Fed, said, Fed fund rate um, in, in, in the next few months. Gold actually lost 30, 40 bucks really, really quick. Uh, quite a bit of air came out of that balloon. We dropped below $2,000 again. So my question to you is like, what's, what's gold going to do moving forward? Well, I think I'll continue to see this, what I call knee-jerk reaction. As you outlined, Kai, I mean, you get this big blip, you get this number, everything reacts. But there's a difference between reaction and a response. A response is where you basically see the situation for what it is. You analyze it properly, you use discernment, and then you do something or don't do something. And the response of the gold market is much more important than the reaction. So the response to the gold market and interest rates is the gold really doesn't care about interest rates until they're meaningful. Now, I know 5% as it was a few months back uh, on some of the money markets close to that uh, was significant, and it is relative to zero. But nonetheless, it's not really above the true inflation rate. When I say true inflation rate, I mean as measured by the 1980 paradigm and it's outlined at uh, shadowstats.com, John Williams site. And in that case, the true inflation rate is probably closer to nine or 10%. So until you get a real rate of return, interest rates don't really mean that much. That's the response of gold, not the reaction of gold. So you'll continue to see pressure to see gold go higher and higher in price. And really it's not, gold's a constant. It's announced everywhere in the universe. The mass never changes. What changes is the amount of dollars printed against it. So it's the dollar depreciation measured in terms of gold that gives you a higher price. And that trend has not ended. And it's probably not going to end. So the gold response will be higher and higher. The reactions will be, let's make sure that we can control the psychology of a new participant in the gold market, a potential participant in the gold market, or maybe some people that are break even or underwater, let's see if we could scare them out. But as far as <clears throat> what the meaning is, I think those two words are something worth reflecting on to get a better picture of how you view the gold market. You don't buy gold for a reaction, you buy gold for a response. And the response of, let's say, people in India, people in Asia, a lot of Europeans, even South Americans is, that all these currencies die and go to heaven. And the only way my family did better while that took place was to own some precious metals. And that's a response. That's not a reaction. That's ingrained basically into their consciousness. And none of them had to listen to you or I to know that. Absolutely, no, history taught them. And uh, being German as well, history yeah. taught us. Yeah, right? if I could just interject so. for a second, I mean, I have to because of that. I mean, I, I've, you know, spoken all around the world, as you know, and I'm not doing nearly as much travel as I was. But the point is, all through Europe, I'd be well received, England, you know, France, you know, I never spoke in Spain, although I've been there. But the point is, the Germans get it. I mean, if any people in Europe get the true meaning and understanding of a depreciation of the current currency, it's Germany. There's no doubt in my mind. I mean, the crowds are bigger, better more energetic, and they really understand it. Uh, whereas some of the other parts of Europe, it seems like, oh yeah, that's that's the past and we've got technology, you know, and we've got this, and it's not gonna happen. And the dollar will never go away, and, you know, who knows? So anyway, back to you, I couldn't help it though, because whenever I traveled in Europe, I always loved it and, you know, but when I got to Germany, man, you know, my energy level like, Double because oh, I can imagine. I can imagine. Um, I had Craig Williams sitting in a chair across from me the other day at uh, the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference, and he called gold a national security asset, which I find a very interesting statement. Would you Would you agree with that, or like would Would you add to that as well? Well, you know, 
me being me, um, I always have an opinion. <clears throat> I am not a, as big a gold bug as I probably appear to, you know, thousands of people that have tuned in over the years. What I don't like about gold is it's controlled by the the bankers, basically. Now, half the gold, roughly it's a 50-50 split. Roughly, central banks have about half the gold and population at large has about the other half. But there's a real problem with the gold only standard. I put it up my Twitter feed recently, and everyone that really wants to be a student of, of markets, a student of money, should look at this article, not written by me. It's called Gold Standard Equals Fiat in Disguise. And the argument is that he who owns the gold makes the rules. And when you own the gold and it's a monometallic standard, you can bend those rules or change those rules to go from you know, 100% gold backing to 40% gold backing to international trade only like Nixon did in 1971. He didn't outlaw gold for international trade. He just it, just made it illegal for Americans to own it. And, and then, of course, he didn't settle in gold to internationally. So I want to be clear on that. But the point is that you always morph into a paper-only standard. And then, well, that's okay because I say so. And Currencies could float against each other. There's no standard. And on and on it goes, which goes to monetary destruction. So gold standard alone, the point is, is not necessarily a means to control an out-of-mind governmental money supply. You really need a bimetallic or trimetallic standard. And that's what that article argues, that with silver in the mix, where silver is the policeman on the amount of gold, uh, then you have really a means to mitigate uh, overprinting. And um, I think it's something some people should pay attention to. So it's better than no standard. It's not the best standard. Uh, I don't know what the one is. I'm just going to do a shameless plug, but I'm working on a documentary called The Silver Sunrise TV. And we're looking at those questions. In fact, we're looking if you even need money. Um, I'm not saying we don't. Certainly in this system, we do. And I actually believe still, and maybe it's the idealistic me, that the precious metals are required and are necessary to, to transition to the next phase, whatever that is, which I don't know. Is it AI-controlled digital currencies? Personally, I hope not, but maybe it will be. My point is when the loss of confidence takes place, confidence will return to something that's had confidence for 5,000 years. And that's precious metals, and probably both. Although gold could be officially used as a backing for a national currency or a world currency or whatever happens, silver probably won't be, but on the street, it probably will be. So that's my different perspective. Yeah. Let's talk silver um, as, as well. Like I asked you before I hit the record button as well that I'm going to, I told you I was going to ask that question, but right. how much of a precious metals is silver still? Like looking at the price action of the last six to 12 months, it's decoupled from gold. Where, where do you put silver in these days? Yeah, and, well, uh, I, you know, and maybe as a follow up, just to add on, sorry, sorry to get, you, get you off, David. Um, as an add on, what you just mentioned, people might use silver still. Is there even enough silver around still? Oh, uh, that's like, a great to, question. To, to, to use that as well. So just as an add on there. Yeah. So um, let me answer the first, the second question first. Is there enough silver? And the answer is no. And here's why. <clears throat> if you go back and you start looking at a chart of the gold-silver ratio back from about oh, 1,000 AD till present day, uh, silver never got above 20 to 1 until the last 130 years or so. So it stuck around the natural ratio which right now is seven to one used to be 12 to one and the edict mandated monetary ratio was 16 to one roughly so it stayed in that range for hundreds and hundreds of for thousands of years and why was that and it took me a while to think of it i'm not as smart as i think i am sometimes i'm trying to be funny here a little self-efficacy but uh because they're both money Silver and gold were money, and that's all they were. It wasn't until you know the late 1800s, 1900s, the, you know the beginning of the age of oil, where we started having all this scientific breakthroughs and the elect electrification of the world, where silver is a key component in an industrial metal. 
So if silver were traded as a monetary asset only and not as an industrial metal and used by the central banks as a monetary reserve, the price of silver could be equal to the price of gold because they're equal in amounts above ground in investment form. I'm not making a case that that's the actual price or should be. I'm just saying since it's be demonetized, it trades as if it's an industrial metal only. But if we did make it a monetary metal, let's look at what it's worth. Right now, the average wage in the United States, believe it or not, I'm not talking minimum wage, I'm talking about the average. People that get paid you know, millions a year, people that make a minimum wage. On aggregate, that's roughly $25 an hour. And an ounce of silver is $25 per ounce. So in a given day, an eight-hour job would be eight ounces of silver, roughly. A dollar is really three-quarters of an ounce, but I'm not going to do the math. I can do it in my head better this way. So that's eight ounces. <clears throat> So eight ounces of silver per day times the labor force, which is something like 120 million, basically takes out the whole silver supply like in less than a week. I forget the exact math. So there's no way. So for silver to become part of the money supply, it has to be traded at a monetary asset, which would mean it'd probably have to be tenfold what it is now. So it would have enough coverage in the marketplace to buy enough goods and services. And so it can't really be money at the price it is now. <clears throat> so the real answer is yes, there's always enough gold or silver as long as the value is commensurate with the amount of gold and, excuse me, the amount of goods and services. So if you took a pile of silver on this side and all the goods and silver, goods and services on this side, there has to be a match. And the market would know that what that is, but it would be far higher. Let's go back and say it another way. If you go back to Roman times, a dime was equal to uh, a, a Roman soldier's daily effort. So that's basically one-tenth of an ounce. So one-tenth of an ounce paid for a day, and now eight ounces pays for a day? Well, do the math. That's like an 80 times ratio. So you need to um, multiply the price of silver by 80 to get to a monetary ratio that's commensurate with what it was in the Roman Empire time. So that's that. Then you ask me, is it an industrial metal or is it a monetary metal? It's still both. Um, there's transactions made in silver uh, for a monetary reason, but officially it's not. So economically, yes. Um, philosophically, no. It's not in the money supply. It's not considered money by any bank anywhere in the world. It's only the people's money and people that transact with it. Uh, for monetary purposes, which is a very, very small subset. But it doesn't mean it couldn't reemerge, especially in the digital age where you can use an asset-backed digital currency and use silver as a backing to a crypto sometime. So there's a possibility that that will, it's taking place, but whether it will gain traction or not, we'll have to wait and see. No, I appreciate that. Thanks for for, for your insights there. Um, let, let's come to the last question, sort of the all-encompassing question that we've been, you know, leading towards as, as well. Like, what is the new monetary system going to look like? You hinted at CBDCs. You mentioned Fed now. Um, the, the run us a bit through your theory how this is all going to play out, and uh, once the reset button is being hit, like, what does day or reset reset plus one day look like? Yeah, my best guess is that it will be actually, for most people, it won't look a lot different. Their debit card and credit card will probably still work through the digital system because most of it's digitized already. The difference will be probably a cashless system, so you can't transfer anything in cash. And the um, interface will either be with the Fed directly, which I doubt because Congress has got to okay it, and who knows what kind of arguments they'll get on the floor of the House and the Senate. But a central bank can't. And so you could have a money center bank like J.P. Morgan take on the burden of making a central bank digital currency, even though they're just running it for the central bank as a service. Of course, they'll collect fees, how, how rare, for providing that service. And everybody gets an announcement in the mail from their bank that uh, 
you know, their account looks the same and everything else, but there will be no further transactions as of March 30th, 2025. If you want to put cash into your digital account, you have to go to the teller, deposit the cash. If it's anything over $10,000, you better have a damn good story of why you have that much cash, you filthy drug pusher, you. And on it goes. So um, the back end will be similar to what we have now, but it'll be programmable. So you'll be able to be traced, taxed at any transaction that you do, and you'll have instant approval or disapproval. So if you are eating too many pizzas, for example, and your carbon footprint's too big, the computer may flag it and say, well, Mr. Morgan, you're on a diet. You can't have another pizza for two months. You're eating too many carbs, or your carbon footprint's too big, or you travel too much, or you put too much diesel in your car, or you bought something on the internet that's politically incorrect, or on and on it goes. So that's the biggest fear factor is what will happen to our freedoms. And that's, I think, the biggest push isn't just to digitize everything, which, again, it mostly is. It's the control. It's the next level of control that they want. They want to control not only your purse strings, but your political thought process. And that, if that doesn't scare you, nothing does, because freedom is can I, can I Just jump in real quick. Just one thought that popped in. I think it's a bit of a controversial question to ask, but... Aren't we experiencing that with credit cards right now? Yes. Like, but uh, you still have the option of cash, I guess, right? So you can still in pay some cash places. in most places. I mean, so. you go to Starbucks, you go to some of these places, and they'll say, we don't accept cash. And then you cause a minor stink, and you hold one up, and you read it to <laughs> the barista or the cashier, I should say. It says, for all debts, public and private. And then they'll tell you, you know, if they know what the argument, they'll say, well, this is a private institution. We don't have to accept cash. No, no, it's for your safety, David. It's yeah. for oh, your yeah. safety. <laughs> exactly. So um, <laughs> it's, it's a brave so. new world. Here we are. And uh, it's, you know, it's worth fighting back. It means you should pay, in my view, my opinion, if you want to keep your freedom, first of all, it's priceless. You know, there is no price on freedom. <laughs> I mean, it is not worth a million each or 10 million or a billion. It's priceless. There's nothing more important that doesn't matter how much money you've got let's go to china for a second i know we're running out of time but in china you could be a billionaire but if you're politically incorrect you can't go send your kids to private school get the apartment you want travel or anything else because you've gone against the state and said something they don't like so you don't have financial freedom anymore and that's something people really have got to get through their heads because you know up until the last 10 years or so i was advocating financial freedom if you had enough stuff enough gold, silver, or even fiat, you know, you can mitigate a lot of life's issues because you had that cushion to go where you want to go, say what you want to say, write what you want to write, and that type. That's gone. You know, I mean, they have taken away our ability to speak and even congregate in some cases. I mean, you look what happened in Canada with the truckers, and then they went and even got their crypto accounts. So well, crypto is the savior. Well, no, it's not. Um, so anyway, it really stirs me up because my life's work to put the money power back in hands. I mean, if there's one thing I've lived for to try to get the money power back to us, where we have control of our own destiny, and we're not controlled by these overlords that control the money money system. David, wonderful conversation. Really appreciate your time as always. We've run uh, almost 45 minutes here now. Uh, fantastic insights. Where, where can we follow you? Where can we find more of your work, David? Yeah, just go to the website, themorganreport.com. There's icons for my Twitter account, YouTube account, Facebook account, LinkedIn. And then to have a look at the uh, the trailers for the movie, silversunrise.tv. Thank you, Kai. Fantastic. No, David, really appreciate it. We need to get you out to Germany to our gold conference. So <laughs> the Deutsche Gold Messe, we need to get you out to the German gold show. Uh, I'm sure you'll rob some people out there. It'd be fantastic <laughs> to host you. <laughs> Fantastic, David. Wonderful, wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for your time. Everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode here of Sort Financially. If you did, if you liked our guest, if you liked the content, please leave a like, leave a thumbs up here as well. It helps us tremendously gauge your interest levels, but also, you know, gauge the content we're producing as well. Really appreciate that. We're really appreciative of our guests coming on for 45 minutes chatting um, about the, the markets, what is happening, trying to educate as well. Leave a, leave a comment. What are you doing? How are you seeing the markets right now as well? We do want to hear from you. We often integrate your questions into our next conversations as well. So 
it is helpful. Thank you so much. We'll be back with lots, lots more. Thank you so much.